All right. Hello from Doha and welcome to the Wavelength Lecture Series. I am Michael Herzard, a faculty member in graphic design at VCU Arts in Qatar. And I'm joined by my colleague, Simone Muscolino, Director of Foundations. Before we begin, I would like to thank VCU Arts Qatar, VCU Arts in Richmond, and the Institute of Contemporary Arts at VCU. And we invite all of you to ask questions via the Q&A, which will be answered at the end of today's presentation. Today, Tarek Atoui joins us from France. Tarek, born in Lebanon and living in Paris, is an artist working within a multidisciplinary space connecting sound, sculpture, installation, and live performance to create a hybrid of sonic experiences that shift perspective. His ready-made artifact instruments come to life through automated looping mechanisms that use contact microphones to modulate vibrations into electronic soundscapes. He has exhibited at the Venice Biennale, the Sharjah Biennale, the Tate Modern, and the TNTU Center for Contemporary Art in Singapore, just to highlight a few. And Tarek was recently awarded the 2022 Susan Deal Booth Flag Art Foundation Prize. I now pass the mic to Simone. Yeah, I just read that during uh, the summer 2018, uh, uh, my colleague Michael and I were able to see Tarek's work in person at the Venice Biennale. We loved it and we knew immediately that uh, we wanted to reach out to him. Tarek uh, graciously accepted the offer to connect with uh, VCU and offer also to collaborate with a new course that uh, we were starting uh, to offer, uh, a course covering sonic exploration called uh, Fabrication of Sound. In this class, students have been working with the VCU faculty and also with Tarek here and there every couple of weeks to create their own musical machines with found materials, motors, and physical computing. It, it has been a, a real pleasure to collaborate with Tarek for the entire semester, and uh, we are very happy to have him uh, with us tonight for, uh, for this talk. Uh, Tarek, the, the stage is yours. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Simone, and good evening to everybody. Thank you all for uh, being present and uh, taking the time to uh, be with us. Uh, and of course, thank you to all the to the, to the faculties uh, to uh, uh, the university in Qatar for uh, hosting me and making this happen. Um, you know, when I started thinking after what we had been doing with Simone and at the university uh, over the last weeks, uh, thinking what would be today's talk, I was rather than talking about projects or talking about the practice. I'll just take you on an adventure. Uh, through listening, listening situations uh, I found myself in throughout the last years and from which a lot of things developed and unfolded. Listening to places, to situations, to people, learning how to listen again and what, the, what listening is, and having had the chance as an artist and a composer to meet uh, amazing, formidable people from our times who listen to the world in a very inspiring way and who definitely influenced how I understand sound, music, art, and what I do at the moment. So this adventure in listening, in my case, well, of course, started when I started making music and showing interest in sound, but the time where I decided to start the project from listening to something was through an invitation I had to the Louis Vuitton Foundation in Paris. The Louis Vuitton uh, company opened a museum in Paris a few years ago called the Louis Vuitton Foundation. Uh, and this is in the outskirts of Paris in Bois de Boulogne. And, and for the opening, this amazing building that was that is done by uh, Frank Gehry, that is an arch architectural uh, uh, pro prowess. Um, I had the honor to be invited, among other artists, to uh, uh, work on this uh, building that was uh, opening in Paris back then. And maybe some of you have seen it. For those who have been uh, to France, it's it's a landmark now in uh, Paris. I share my screen here, so you see it. It is this building done by Gary and that has this kind of boat that is that that has its seals blown by air then and that is floating on a surface of water 
that is uh, surrounding it. So this building was, is, and still is, it's new, very unique in the sense that the materials it is made out of, the uh, volumes that, it, that Frank Gehry created inside of it are multiple. And I think there were about 50 architectural uh, uh, brevets, like patents uh, developed with this, um, uh, with this building, uh, uh, established through this building. And when I was invited to do this project, I said, why not this time listen to an architecture? And why not take the architecture as a starting point for this proposition and listen to it, see what it tells us, kind of in a very simple way, sample this architecture, sample it in the sense of uh, uh, electroacoustic and music concrete, concrete music, music that works with field recordings, something that I had studied personally in my youth and that I was attentive to. I had always used field recordings within my music and mixes and uh, pieces, but this time I decided to take these as the main component and the main material of the work. And to do this, what I did was uh, to be able to capture and listen to this building, I said, I'm going to invite several types of people that record sound. From people that record sound in the world of cinema, to people to record sound for radio, to people that record sound for, from wildlife and documenting Earth, to uh, people that recorded sound in an experimental way and uh, using it for sound art and for what we call radiophonic music. So like a kind of a storytelling through sound or using sound for storytelling. So back then, that was in 2014, if my memory is correct, I had the pleasure to work with Stéphane Rive, Eric Lacaza, Chris Watson, and Frédéric Nogré. The four of them, as I said, each came from a different background, and um, each got invited to this building that was still a construction site, about to finish, to walk in that empty, empty building, listen to it first, then over a week, use whatever microphones, whatever techniques, and record areas in the building, how they perceived it and thought of it. The experience was amazing. It really changed my understanding of sound. And by inviting so many people from different uh, horizons, I was uh, expecting to learn from them. So I was always close, nearby, not very much interfering in what they did if they needed space, if they needed privacy, if they needed to be away, just to have silence and listen, I would. And I was very attentive to this. But I uh, saw amazing attitudes deployed in terms of understanding what this building is. I'll show you here. Some situations where these amazing people captured things in the building I was not thinking or doubting they existed. This situation, for example, is one where we see Eric Lacaza under this big light shaft which is like a big hole in the ceiling that goes up to eight meters and above, and standing still, holding a pair of uh, microphone, of stereo microphones, and very, very slowly moving his hand to capture how air was moving inside this space. So it was not a sound. It was something we could not even hear. Like It was so microscopic and so delicate that he was you know, following air currents inside the room, positioning himself in the place where they were swirling the most and capturing very low bassy sounds. And that for me was an indicator of a very high skill in terms of understanding what a space is, what mass is, what vibration is. And this unique situation I saw Eric Lacaza on foot, Chris Watson from his side, and I'll speak more about who is Chris, who is Eric. On his side, he recorded the wind moving in these big seals that the building had. And with 
Chris's high sensibility, we heard that these big rails or big metal and aluminum structures were like giant flutes whistling to the sound of the wind. And you had to put your ear inside to listen to their very delicate uh, uh, whistling and medium frequencies that were coming out. In other situations, Chris took contact microphones. These are specific microphones that Michael mentioned in his introduction. Actually, I use a lot of microphones and contact microphones are definitely ones of them. And I learned how to work and use microphones through these people I'm talking about today. In the photos we see here, Chris used contact microphones to put those in trees around the foundation. And you could hear with the wind moving the tree, the whole structure of the tree crackling and twisting as a huge boat, as, as, as if you were on a giant vessel that was carried by wave. And uh, if you closed your eyes, this was the real scenery that we had from listening to the insides of the tree. Or in the image below the tree, we see here a metal grid that is the security fence surrounding this building in construction at that time, where a contact microphone was also placed, capturing the streets, the city, even the refractions of the city in the building sails back into the fence. And this very metallic sound, as if the sound was coming from deep inside material and matter. That was also for me mind opening. In this photo here, we saw we see Frédéric Nogret recording magnetic interference that are inside certain machines and using microphones that are called co coil microphones to capture interferences and wavelength that are inaudible to the ear. Things where uh, you hear the distortion, the parasite noise, lots of uh, waves that surround us on a daily basis, but which we are not aware of. And in this image here, Chris Watson looking for sound ended up in this bush at sunset recording bats that were flying around the foundation. And he recorded actually bats emitting these very high pitch that uh, very high sounds that we don't hear called ultrasounds and using these sounds to guide themselves with this very ac acute sense of direction and the sonars they use. So we could hear how bats were deflecting from one tree to another, uh, emitting signals, receiving them, knowing where they are in space. And this was again captured with special microphones and device that uh, scientists use for uh, recording wild wildlife and uh, bats. And in this last image, I'll show you, and really there were like tens of examples on this adventure of listening to the building and what, to what it is, where Eric Lacaza was standing underneath this, uh, uh, it's actually a water pond that was empty on that day and listening to the building under the umbrella of this uh, metal structure here that acted like an umbrella and like a, a parabolic shape that was very much refracting sound and making it very distorted and strange. And it's a situation that was unique because ever since there was water here and the space changed. And in addition to this, what we, a lot of the things we recorded were sounds uh, of empty spaces. So actually it's not silence and you would like still hear the acoustic of the space empty, or actually it's a sound that was not to be present again in the building. The building never returned to this situation of uh, having such empty volumes, of having this zero state acoustic. It has been since occupied by people. Even at night, it has been occupied by artwork, by isolation panels, by exhibition walls. So these acoustics and traces were also very uh, inspiring in like a testimony of the building's identity and what the building was. So I spoke about uh, Chris Watson, and here I will share some names with you. Please, it will be too long today to take you through 
the works of everybody or to show you their web pages and websites and to also share their works and compositions with you but i would what i but what i ask you to do is go check them out just google chris watson google eric la casa You will see their works. I'll just speak about two here, Chris, and very briefly. Chris Watson is like a master, a real master in terms of listening to the world and recording sound. Maybe, and I'm sure uh, a lot of you here know him. Uh, Chris is initially a musician and one who comes from this very famous uh, group called Cabaret Voltaire, English group that was very influential in the 70s and in the 80s. Uh, Sorry, hop. Oh, yeah, somebody is. Sent. Oh. Sorry, I'll send you the names again. As. Oh. So, Chris Watson has since been a member and founder of Cabaret Voltaire, which is a band and a great project. He stopped, dedicated his life to traveling the world and recording sounds on multiple places in this planet and he is one of the greatest contributors to the archive of the BBC in England uh, his recordings as I said are recordings of wildlife amazing but also of places of climatic phenomena of uh, geological phenomena of very rare events that can range from listening to the heartbeat of a bird to listening to glaciers melting uh, to listening to the activity of volcanoes or hunting blue whales in the four corners of the oceans and uh, <laughs> failing to, uh, to catch their sounds uh, through several, uh, over several years. Um, yeah, Chris's archive is unbelievable. And um, what I uh, learned from Chris and seeing him work, and it was like really an honor that he accepted this invitation, was how he was able to listen to a space and know in a very intuitive uh, and genuine, like almost naive uh, way, where to place his microphones and how to set up his equipment, then step back, put his recorder on, put his headphones on, take a notebook, a pen, and note down all the events that were happening in the recording or what he was listening to in his headphones like door slam at one minute 41 at two minute 30 bird ch chipping away at da -da -da, with observations about the sound it was like very personal uh, ways of noting and uh, a very personal sound diary but that allowed him after to come and listen to uh, minutes and minutes of material he recorded because when he recorded he placed this microphone as a fisherman would do with his net and stepped back and sometimes recorded for an hour an hour 20 minutes during which he did not move he did not make a sound and he was just in this activity of listening and taking notes eric lacasa on his side came from uh radio practices and from experimental music. He's somebody who used, who uses um, uh, electronic, uh, sorry, who uses field recording and recording sound and, nat uh, and nature and in a way that sounds and seems very much electronic and very weird. Like he has a project that is amazing that states, which statement is that listening starts in one's own apartment and uh, environment and it happened before lockdown and confinement uh, he made a whole album listening to noises in his apartment so like the noise of the fridge uh, the noise of the ventilator uh, the noise of the uh, power supply of his laptop uh, uh, the inner functionings of his tv all these like parasite things that surround us and that we are actually not aware of you see like sometimes they're under our couch or in hidden corners or areas sometimes they're outside the window or in these uh, fields that we don't hear like these wavelength interferences ultrasounds so eric uh did projects like these 
that also required a lot of patience, a lot of steadiness and stability when it came to capturing sound and uh, perceiving it. But unlike Chris, who knows how to pull back and stand, move away, uh, Eric uses uh, this short stick with microphones and goes chasing sounds and moving with them. He's always dancing with the sounds he hears very subtly, very delicately. Like if this is his microphone sticks, he's moving so slowly, even slower than this. And this little movement, when you hear it on headphones or when you hear it on good sound system, has huge impacts on in terms of sound. Like you feel like hmm, a lot is happening. But actually, what is happening is just him very slowly moving and following this vibration and what sound is creating. So from this experience and from listening to the building at uh, in Paris at Louis Vuitton and having had the honor to work with these sound recordists, uh, I had kind of wor like worked with specialists of listening. I'm not saying specialists of hearing. There's a difference between hearing and listening. And at the end of uh, this presentation, I will give you precise ideas of what I'm talking about. Uh, people, uh, Eric, Frédéric, Chris, Stefan, were people who listen uh, and who developed like an, the practice of listening as something daily they relate to as musicians, as human beings. They are human beings who actually understand the world through sound and understand objects, physicality, materiality through the sound that uh, objects and elements produce. So after worker working with these master listeners and like a very high level, very high specialty. I went working with the opposite side of the spectrum with another uh, type of specialists uh, in terms of listening to sound. And these were deaf people, people who don't perceive sound through their ears and through air, but because of this uh, disability, developed an expertise and an ability of listening to sound in a multisensorial way. And what I mean by this is that deaf people are experts in listening to sound and perceiving sound as vibration without the ears and outside of uh, this organ that tends to monopolize our understanding of what listening is and uh, what, what is the impact of listening in our bod and on our body and uh, senses and therefore on our positions as citizens in this world and human beings part of a bigger uh, um, community. So deaf people, the experience with deaf people started, and I say deaf people, I don't use the word hard of hearing or hearing impaired or uh, terms like these, it's just deaf. And this really came from working with hundreds of uh, individuals who lost their hearings in multiple circumstances in different parts of the world, in different languages, ages, and cultures. Um, this experience changed my relationship to sound, to be honest with you, and to composition, to instrument making, to uh, all the aspects that deal with uh, music, performance, concert, uh, installation art and to make a story short uh what happened with deaf people was something based on an intuition and uh an experience i started conducting in Sharjah in 2012 so it was something i already started i had already started uh before working on this uh architecture project but 
I was not aware of how it was going to change and affect my practice for the years to come. So in Sharjah, some of you I'm sure know the Sharjah Art Foundation and uh, its implication in the Emirates and the pioneering work that it has been doing in contemporary uh, and visual arts. I was at that time resident, uh, artist on residency at the Sharjah Art Foundation. And um, I asked the foundation to take me to work uh, at a school for the deaf, because I was interested in how deaf people perceive bass frequencies outside of their ears and through their bodies. It was really like taking things with the most simple uh, approach, bass, loud sound, strong, strong sound. We feel it as you all have experienced sound in a club or in a situation where it was loud, like hitting us and making us that kind of move. Uh, so asked the foundation there to take me to Al Amal School for the Deaf. And there I brought subwoofers and I brought equipment to work with the students on this. But what I discovered on these first series of workshops is that uh, like these people had a much wider understanding of sound than bass, uh, high free, uh, low frequency uh, beats and things like this. There was something much more subtle. And here I will share with you a video, like a short video of an experimentation process that I did there with colleagues, friends of mine, a duo of curators called Council. In 2013, we went together after a first experience I had to Al Amal School for, for the Deaf. And over there, we did the following. Okay, this is just a small extract. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, if the video is lagging a bit. I am. Uh, I apologize for this. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's maybe your connection on your end. We tested things uh, later on. Everything was working on our side. Uh, so, what happened on this experiment? Anyways, it's okay if it's lagging. Was that students from Al Amal School for the Deaf uh, went with these sound recorders into the city, accompanied by artist Wendy Jacob and musician Hassan al Hujairi from Bahrain. Uh, and it was Wendy's idea. So we know Wendy actually noticed that students were recording sounds on which they saw or observed movement. Sometimes there was no sound, there was just movement, like a police siren blinking, but not producing sound, or uh, somebody. Uh, uh, a, a ventilator road turning, but not making audible sound. Um, it was a very interesting observation about movement being 
a signal or a witness of the presence of sound. And it's a very interesting idea. The same thing with light, light being a uh, witness or uh, uh, an indicator of the presence of sound. But there are also other things we learned from working with deaf people that sound was not just like movement or uh, light, but it could also be something that is signaled with sign language. You see, sign language, although it doesn't have a very wide vocabulary, but the body can express sound or talk about sound. And also in the same way, what I started with was also a valid way of listening, listening with the body, you know, listening, sound, kind of addressing different parts of our body, like an understanding, for example, that bass frequencies uh, have the tendency to hit us most in the lower part of our body, like to hit us in the feet, we hear them sometimes in the chest, but in the chest, we tend to hear more medium frequencies and in the mind, like, or in the head, more high pitch, high tone frequencies, like kind of, even there are scientific studies about this, that each organ in the, in the human body has a frequency to which it responds and resonates most. So this idea of listening with the body is very valid. And there is even more subtlety to this. There is this possibility of listening with different parts of our skeleton and our uh, bone system. So listening with the fingers, listening with the head, with the forehead, listening with the teeth. Um, I saw so many techniques and technologies that are now working with listening through bone conduction and through the bones. And there are like headphones, there are systems. And maybe the oldest example that I observed in this was uh, Beethoven, who uh, deaf was, uh, and this is a story that says this, uh, but I think it's a confirmed story, was biting on a wooden rod next to his piano so he could uh, uh, like uh, hear the, or feel the, 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 the sounds of the chords he was playing on, on, uh, on the piano. So the notion of listening expanded a lot from working with uh, deaf people. And the discoveries that we did with Council on such workshops in 2013 in Sharjah allowed me to continue this exploration and to take it further on multiple occasions afterwards as this project that uh, as this became a project, or actually this was already part of a project called Within, on which I was investigating the relationship between uh, uh, sound and deaf culture. And actually what started happening after this um, experience is that I started building, or I had the idea from these workshops of starting to build instruments, music instruments that used these different ways or that played on these different ways of perceiving sounds and uh, that instruments that could be played by deaf and hearing people at the same time. And through these instruments, what I was interested in exploring actually is not just building the instruments, but trying to see how the meeting between deaf and hearing world through these instruments that made this meeting possible would generate as new ideas for making music, for playing together, for composing, for having these two worlds that we think are separate, that we think are not able to communicate, communicate through sound making and sound practice. And to do this, I will give you a few examples before showing you what this ensemble of instruments is and what this orchestra is. I'll here take a few seconds to share with you this situation. It's a situation on which I built certain instruments and took them to meet deaf people to whom I said, friends, I have these instruments. I don't know how they're played. Maybe together we can learn what to do with those. And this is in this video, we will see the result of a few testimonies. There is no sound. It's all sign language and subtitles. A few testimonies of how certain people played drums and instruments. I was working with them with them on.
Wir können mit einem Tonband streiten spielen. Der, der Tonband befindet sich oberhalb der Zitrommel und ist mit einem dünnen Draht befestigt. Ihr könnt direkt am Tisch beginnen mit, äh, mit zwei Fingern oder mit drei Fingern. Ich kann euch überlassen. Ihr müsst dann nur darauf achten, dass ihr nicht so einen zu starken Druck zieht. Wenn ihr das tut, dann schneidet ihr möglicherweise in eure Finger und ihr kriegt dann auch Reibung. Ihr könnt vom Tisch rückwärts bewegen. Ihr könnt auch stehen bleiben. Und wenn ihr in einer bestimmten Entfernung äh, getogen habt, dann könnt ihr auch wieder nach vorne gehen. Ihr könnt dann auch den Winkel variieren. Die Entfernung könnt ihr dann auch dann mit dem Winkel zusammen variieren. Die Vibration, die ihr dabei, also sobald ihr das zieht, spürt ihr direkt die Vibrationen in euren Fingern. Am Tisch wird die Vibration nicht so stark zu spüren, als wenn ihr dann weiter vom Tisch entfernt. Für mich persönlich äh, klingen die Vibrationen vergleichbar mit einem LKW oder mit einem Motorradtopper. Okay. Wir können mit Okay, so these were a few testimonies on how two people played a drum, a drum, like a circular drum I had given them, a table that has had a drum in it. And actually, these objects or these like tape, marble, rope uh, that uh, the, 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 the collaborators I worked with on these workshops brought were given to me at the end by these people, like were gifted to me to become part of the instruments. So it was like their sticks, their mallets, and their propositions of building, of sorry, of completing the instrument or finishing the idea. The idea of the instruments for me actually was finished after this workshop. And these instruments have a whole story to them. But I'll show you here a video of the first time of the first concert that took place on the all this ensemble of instruments that was built after this experience and this after this open to the last and thir third and last part of my talk
okay this can go on for a few minutes more uh but yes this was like the orchestra of within that i keep on building i keep on having grow i keep on using for collaboration between uh deaf and the hearing people and uh Yes, these, this project and these instruments and the learnings of this about what listening is, yeah, changed <laughs> my work a lot. And today, wh where am I with all this? Like in these last 10 minutes, maybe what I would, would like to, to share with you is work I'm currently developing and thinking about that uh, builds up on all these ideas of uh, listening. Uh, that you saw from this building, that you saw from listening to this building, to uh, listening with deaf people to materials and instruments. Uh, today, like the act of listening for me, I have a lot of fun with this idea of what am I listening to? How am I listening to? With whom? Where? Are questions that I use a lot in my work and scramble and uh, shuffle together to create unique objects and situations. I'll show you some of those um, works in progress that are at the moment in my uh, underground studio in Paris. Hop, open these images, share screen, these, hop. Okay, and you see here, I have this, uh, these ideas I'm working on. Um, and that's a series of pieces I call the whisperers. And what they're about actually is that these are listening device. They are really listening device. Um, they're not instruments, they can be played, but their thinking and the approach behind them is that they are uh, things like a turntable or uh, like an MP3 player, uh, where you bring a music, you bring a track and listen to it in a way you've never did, you've never did before. So what happens with a machine like this one is actually here on one end, you have a cable that you can connect to your phone. So in an exhibition space or in an installation of mine, this will be used as a terminal where you can come play a piece of music, you know, and that you may be heard for a hundred times until today. And then put on a pair, of, a pair of headphones like you do in a record shop, you know, and listen to the music you're playing through it. And actually what happens in a, a system like this one is that sound gets played from your phone into a contact speaker that is inside this box and to which this symbol, this percussion symbol is mounted. So the sound vibrates in the metal. You don't hear it very much. It's really inside the metal. Then on the symbol, what you have lying and resting here is a piano string. This is one of the bass, thick, heavy strings that is here lying on the metal circle and capturing the vibration or the sound that, it's, that is in it and transmitting it here to a contact microphone. You remember this contact microphone, this thing I showed you that was in the water and on the fence in, uh, sorry, not in the water, that was in the tree and on the fence of the Louis Vuitton Foundation. It's this type of microphone, listening to what is, or capturing what is inside the metal um, piano string and sending it to the headphones. So it's a circuitry actually. This machine is a piece of circuitry uh, that in which your track is going to sound like it is happening very low inside a metal room very far and distant away from you and actually when you move on the symbol the piano string if you just like have fun changing its position on the circle you will hear different uh, distortions uh, resonances induced by the metal plate and the metal string in contact with each other. So this sound is really like the, the acoustic or this machine creates a very unique and strange and changing acoustic environment and gives you a very different perception of a sound material or an element you are familiar with. In the same 
way, here is another one of these whisperers. In this case, this whisperer, what it does, again, the same idea of you plugging a phone, listening to a track. The track is played on the lower side of this drum kick, like it's from a, it's a bass drum from a drum uh, kit, and heard back or captured by a contact microphone that is on the upper skin. So on the lower skin, I send the sound and catch it back on the upper skin. And it's actually migrating through the volume of this drum kick. So actually the drum kick becomes like a space or like an architecture in which the sound is happening. And when you put on your headphones and listen to your music being played inside of this, you would feel that the music is inside the club, something that has boom, the bass to it and like low resonance. And you are standing outside of the club, listening to the music from afar. And again, an idea of special acoustic. And actually in this case, what is also happening is that the skin, the lower upper skin of the drum on which the contact microphone is placed is itself acting like a listening membra membrane and a microphone that is listening to the rest of the space. So it becomes very sensitive to the ambient sound, to people talking and this ambient sound together with the sound of the music and everything mix and mash together to again, create a very different way of listening to something you are familiar with. So the whisperers or these works in progress, I call the whisperers. I have done several of them so far and st will still be like in the coming weeks. Uh, but actually these are listening device, you see, to sound, to music that I was, as I was telling you, we are familiar with. But to me, the way I see them and uh, the ultimate thing or the ultimate thing that these elements allow us to listen to is people, you see. The idea of that with these machines and through these machines, by offering to people the possibility to listen differently, you are listening to them. And what I mean by this is that uh, you saw, oh, sorry, I'll share the screen again, because that's one possibility and there are more. Um, like, go back to the first example. In this case, in the case of this machine, what's happening is that, the, as I said, the sound is going from the contact speaker to the symbol, but the symbol is acting actually like, like a record or like a surface that is changeable. You can take it out screw it off very simply and come place something else on this machine, something else than the symbol to listen to sound to. So there is this idea of record or of um, like a disc, a salad bowl, uh, I don't know, like a, a cup or anything you, you, could, you can mount to, uh, uh, to this machine and send sound through and go capture it with this piano string. And in the same way, the piano string can also change. So my intention with these machines is of course, to use them like terminals to listen to sound with and to compose them and put them within bigger orchestras and use them with other works. But uh, what I would be doing firstly with those is activating them on workshops, sharing them with people that are maybe deaf, maybe hearing, maybe professional musicians, maybe amateurs, the, the possibilities are wide, and invite them to bring their own record to the equation in a way that a machine like this one would build uh, its uh, community of objects or would build its community of records. And that these, this idea of collecting the records and like building an environment like building the ecosystem of this machine is in itself an act of listening to people, you know, of listening to how they deal with their daily life of, uh, yeah, of like allowing them to inject a part of them, you see, in a work like this one, without necessarily having to use language or without necessarily communicating in the usual means and ways of doing so. So with this, I'm about to finish. And before I finish, uh, I would like to make an homage and tribute to somebody who has taught me a lot about listening and uh, without whom 
many of the ideas and the projects uh, I discussed today, especially within, would, have not, would, have, would not have happened. It is composer and performer Pauline Oliveros. Pauline is, please Google her name, go search her work and her life work. She passed away uh, a couple of years ago, unfortunately. The performance I showed from within with this deaf conductor, Robert Demeter, uh, performing is a piece by Pauline Oliveros. She helped me a lot and contributed greatly to uh, uh, to the project within. Uh, Pauline Oliveros is like the creator of a practice called deep listening. And there's a video of, of her doing a TEDx talk that speaks about the difference between listening and hearing. So I believe that her answer to what listening versus to what hearing is, is on YouTube, like in a conference she gave, it's 10 minutes, you can listen, hear it. She also speak about where the ideas and concept of this practice called deep listening come from. It's deep listening very briefly is a way of listening to the world uh, that extends our hypersensitivity of sound, our conscious and unconscious uh, understanding and perception of this phenomenon. And actually deep listening, started with a disc that was recorded in a cistern that is underground and that has a huge reverb. Uh, so, well, since we ran out of time, I will invite you to go search the Deep Listening album on Spotify or YouTube and listen to one or several tracks of it. You will see, it's amazing. And if you listen to the TEDx talk, Sorry. Uh, sorry, I've been sending messages to the same person. Hope. Sorry, can you see it now? <laughs> okay. And yes, please check out Pauline Oliveros. Like I'm still learning from Pauline Oliveros today. And voila, that's it. That's what I had to share with you about uh, some... Uh, yeah, some situations of listening, some people who listen to the world differently and who changed and still change the way I listen to objects, I listen to human beings, I listen to the world around me and learn. Like, uh, it's a great lesson of humility, actually. And that's, uh, that's what I'm really happy with. So thank you very much. And please, now, if you have any questions, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to answer those. If any of the panelists have questions, please write them um, so that we can see the questions. And I guess I will start out, uh, Tarek, and ask you, um, ask you a question um, just to get us rolling. Um, I was really struck by something you said in your presentation when you were talking about working with some of the deaf, deaf participants um, and this idea of perceived sound, like when they were looking at a fan, but maybe the fan didn't make the noise and that kind of thing and how, and how it inspired some of your work. Um, and I, I feel from seeing some of your work, your work has this very like objectness to it in the in the sculptures of the pieces that you choose to make like there's a there's kind of like a visual poetry in the way that they move and the way that they look um and i i and they don't always sound the way that i would expect them to sound when i look at them mm -hmm. so maybe i guess my question off of that would be like how does the visual perception of sound play a role in the work that you create mm. Well, like there is, there is definitely since within like um, a play on um, seeing a sound before hearing it. Sometimes you see, mm. uh, especially that uh, uh, light travels faster than sound, so you you are sometimes more inclined to perceive it before. Um, I'll give you an example that once happened to me on a performance I did in an island uh, in. Uh, 
Brazil in Porto Alegre. Uh, we were in an abandoned factory, like it was, an abandoned, it was the building of the Biennale was a factory by the water. And far out, there was an island that used to be a prison. And uh, that was kind of part of the thinking of this like kind of remote land, you see. And said, my performance was about putting microphones on this island and sending a radio signal to the to the land you see like the sound of the island being sent through radio waves broadcasted and i was using these radio waves to perform and at some point there's a helicopter that came you see uh and it was the first time actually we heard the helicopter before we saw it <laughs> you see and uh and that, that's a helicopter, you know, and I was super happy because you usually tend to see things before you hear them. Or, so uh, anyhow, it's like what's uh, like uh, the relationship to, to visual elements is like, is in this actually, is in playing on like how you're gonna perceive something as I was saying. So sometimes I, I would like through a movement or through the oscillation of an object or a motor rotating or something that is clinging in a very uh, kind of naive or silly way. Uh, like you see like a kind of stick hitting a stone or like a motor hitting a, a glass wall. Um, uh, yeah, creating something that we can understand visually before understanding sonically and that then starting to play with the sound appearing disappearing or like being seen from close afar um the idea of considering uh sound visual was very liberating to me or at least gave me another tool to compose with that's great thank you thanks for that um and I, a follow up to that while I wait for any other questions or for anyone else to jump in, I guess another another aspect is some of your work um, play, plays itself. You know, it's very it's uh, it's like self playing through the motors and these sort of things. And then some of the work you create needs human intervention or human interaction. Um, and is there you know, is there a difference in the way that you think about approaching work when there is human interaction involved versus it just being self self played? Yes, sorry, Michael, if, if sorry, I just lost you a bit just the last sentence you said, please. Yeah. Um, is there a difference in your approach to making work when an instrument is going to be self played versus being played by a human? Yes. Well, Michael, this is this is like yeah. Sorry, I didn't tackle a lot of these questions of installations that are mechanized, you know, and like. But I'll give the names of a few projects that can illustrate that would illustrate what uh, what you're talking about. So, friends, I would invite you panelists and attendees to check a piece called "The Ground." Also, uh, uh, at the moment in Germany, I have an exhibition called Water's Witness. On YouTube, you will find images of these two. The ground is at Venice Biennale, and I think, Michael, you're referring in several cases to this piece. Uh, and Water's Witness as well like is a very sculptural piece that has these ideas of automatized instruments of like, like a kind of orchestra playing by itself, like or a, a strange uh, cosmogony of somehow uh, of instruments, objects, artifacts, all sounding together in, in, in like uh, uh, logics that are a bit uh, seen <laughs> of their own. Uh, the idea of automatizing an instrument or we're making an instrument and then automatizing it through a robot, a robot or a motor or something playing it uh, is always the result of a lot of experimentation and performative situation that happen with human beings and people you see. So um, that's, uh, that's what informs what this, what's this idea of what is the instrument without human beings or how this instrument plays on, on uh, itself and sometimes in a way like the instrument is playing on its own in a way that humans would not play it. you see it's not always about like calking or imitating humans or using them as models for uh the the automation uh but uh in all cases in these pieces the instrument has always got like multiple realities inside this piece so even if it's automated it has the possibility to be disconnected from this orchestra and this ensemble and to be performed on its own 
outside of the exhibition space, outside of the composition and this context that I created as my composition. My composition is my proposition, but my but it's also a way for other people to enter the work and to appropriate these instruments and work with. Them. Okay, and here I think I we have uh, yes, Michael. Does this answer your question? Before I answer Catherine's and Astrid's. Yes, most definitely. Okay, great, Catherine. Thank you very much. Uh, um, and yes, like uh, if you use sign language with uh, uh, to communicate with your uh, child, we yeah, I, I'm sure you under, you'll understand where I'm where I'm coming from. And actually, what's been happening uh, lately, like uh, uh, with lockdown and confinement, is uh, the, the same way. Like intuitively, I found myself working with deaf people. I found myself working in a kindergarten, you see, and volunteering there uh, on ideas that uh, were inspired by within, you see, and also other things like really working with four years old was a very uh, important uh, step for me in terms of like finding new audiences and taking maybe COVID as a, as a platform or as an opportunity to go find audiences near us uh, around the corner. Uh, and the experience of working with four years old in that sense uh, on these things was um, um, uh, like, uh, first of all, was about making sound it wasn't about making music you see like that's that's for me what was the most important point of all like for it's making the distinction between music and sound i'm not making music for example with four years old i'm making sound and it's important because their understanding of music is uh related to the songs they sing with their teacher, to the instruments they see uh, around them, like uh, to the melodies and the things they like to hum and uh, share together. With, with me, we do things without any taboo. It, everything is, uh, uh, there is no music. It's just about playing, manipulating, experiencing, and listening. Even the idea of playing together is not yet something I take uh, students to, uh, like kids to work with. Uh, that's something that comes for me at a later stage when it's not necessary. When you are into listening, you are into the manipulation of objects, you are into a sensorial, synesthetic way of understanding the world. Uh, yeah, better to focus on this. And music comes after, you see, like really, it's, it's maybe not about making music, you see. And that's why I also chose this topic today. It's really about listening because from this, everything can unfold and you can have things unfold the way you want, musically or not. So Astrid, yes, deep listening. I'm sorry, I'm reading your question, Astrid. Yeah, I think that, I think that uh, Astrid is a more a comment rather than a question. While yes, Mary, a Mary has a question that follows up with uh, yes. what you already said, and then we have another question in the Q&A. But go ahead with Mary once. Because, I'm reading Mary's question, yes. Yeah, I think it is, uh, is a follow-up with uh, what you already said. Yeah. Yes. Well, Mary, you see, like one thing that struck me, like when when you say, "Oh, like, uh, like when we first discovered that somebody's deaf," you know, like we discover it to them not hearing our voice as parents. Maybe you see, like, see my kids is not responding to my voice. Something's wrong. Uh, uh, this for me is like already like uh, like a partial definition of uh, a handicap. Like, of course, there, there is like a situation of disability. You cannot understand a certain range of frequencies sometimes that are the frequencies of the voice. But it doesn't mean like in some cases that you are not understanding all frequencies and all sounds. Uh, and yeah, you, know, you can see there is already like an unfair <laughs> introduction to the subject or you find yourself classified in a way that is a bit total, total you see. Then the nuances and like the, the, the degrees of deafness and starts to be at, stud, at stake, well, examined and studied by medical uh, uh, criteria. But uh, like, as I said, like uh, uh, you were asking me 
how non-hearing people typically experience sound, I said it, like they experience it through the body, they experience it with the eyes, they experience it with sign language, you know, like that's already a lot of ways. Uh, and was it was was this type of collaboration new for them? Yes, it was definitely new because like uh, th their experience to sound had always been like always for a lot of cases or at least in countries where they don't have music or sound education because in, like in, in uh, the relationship to sound was medical. It was like these frequencies that we play to you to see if you hear or not, these things that we make vibrate to see if you sense them or not, this learning of speech where like, so like the sound was always like something that was there to put pressure, you know, to like uh, exerting force or like treatment. So there was a lot of work of undoing things, of stepping back and like, placing sound as something or introducing sound as something you could have fun with, you know, and like that you could understand the world through and that you could claim also, you know. So uh, this affected a lot how we designed the instruments and how we thought the situations of rehearsals of uh, what we were doing. It's a lot like what I was what I've been saying in this situation of working with the kindergarten. Um, yeah. It's not about making music, maybe, you know, it's maybe about making something else. And that's where the, the, the story starts. Yeah, and Mary's also asking a more practical yeah. question about so, who were collaborator. So yeah. first of all, it was a duo of uh, uh, curators called Council. And I think their website is council.art. Their Gregory and then they organized a series of workshops with me and other people like uh, following my invitation and here there there was Wendy Jacob as artist uh, I also recommend you check her work and Hassan Jairi who's a musician and old player and very good experimental musician from Bahrain Eric, I would move to Arhama, which uh, asks something that I know is very close to your practice. Uh, she asks, uh, do you think there is different sound behind different walls made of different materials? For example, a wooden panel, concrete, metal, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a different sound? Yes, there is. Uh, like if you, if you are based in Qatar, <laughs> and if you are uh, at the university, there is a project by one of Simone's uh, uh, students. I don't know if she is here with us, uh, who is uh, uh, Ruda, actually, who is working on the sound uh, inside, like outside or inside different materials. And yes, there is. There is definitely a difference. Um, and the experience is very easy if you want to try it. Take a speaker and play the same sound. You see like uh, the same music or sound uh, behind three different uh, types of walls, a concrete wall, uh, a textile uh, curtain and uh, a wooden uh, door, you will see. Uh, I think that uh, next one can be Leland. Leland is asking, uh, uh, if you think there is a difference in the way you interpret uh, urban sound versus natural sound, is mm -hmm. this a consideration in your process? Uh, well, uh, Lila, if I had more time today, uh, Leland, I, if I had more time, I was going to present to you like a, a project I worked with, uh, I worked on with Chris and Eric La Casa as well. That's about recording harbors and when like on which we go record like big uh, important harbors in the world, like Abu Dhabi, Singapore, Athens, Beirut, uh, and others. And actually, in these, on this project, we are often confronted with the idea of urban sound and natural sound, because around the harbors, you have, of course, very urban industrial sounds. But uh, you also have very natural sounds because of like some have natural reserves or are in area that are inaccessible to habitation and human life. And on a project like this one, honestly, no, we make no difference. Like there is no, no difference between this and that. On the contrary, like uh, uh, there are similarities. There are of course differences, but the idea is not to distinguish them. The is to see how they can live together. You see the same way, like for me, like I don't consider there is a difference between 
digital and analog. There is no difference between uh, like uh, 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 like in certain like well, I'm gonna say, like, you see like between the all the new let's say you, start, you see like all these things can participate and participate together differently like even deaf and hearing people participate together differently when it comes to making music or making sound or playing together thank you Tarek next one uh, uh, is Hannah and then we have uh, Basma Michael if you want to jump in uh, please don't hesitate Hannah is asking uh, it's a little bit difficult for me I'll try to do my best can you talk about how you use the phenomenological as a tool of knowledge and point of contact to think about how we move through spaces while still operating in the ethereal and how these might be challenging. Uh, the first part, the first sentence, please, Simone, again, please. Can you talk about how you use the phenomenological as a tool of knowledge and a point of content, contact to think about how we move through spaces? Mm. Uh, well, uh, like the phenomenological uh, is part of it, but it's not it's not the only component. You see, the phenomenology of sound, the way sound is forming in a space, is definitely something that guides me in taking decisions of how we navigate a space. You see, but it's not the only one. It is always combined with a lot of like other uh, um, parameters that are. Sometimes, uh, well, also they are part of phenomenology that kind of, uh, but that don't follow like just that sometimes try to counterpoint how a sound is, occupies a space or that sometimes try to invert or intertwine like, uh, yeah, uh, kind of play with the access to sound or how you would like, like kind of inverting this phenomenology or like uh, to give you an example like saying like sometimes trying to imagine like a very big object in the space that is moving <laughs> bigly but that you can just hear very tinily on a pair of headphones somewhere in the corner uh, this and the phenomenological thing is augmented by empirical situations you see and there were like empirical situations of working with sometimes uh, or like I had the chance and the privilege to see choreographers and performers at work in terms of like navigating performance spaces, uh, perf navigating exhibition spaces. Uh, 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 and I'll here, I'll give you some names of projects by that's and uh, yeah these are uh, these are Hannah a few projects that for me are very good in terms of navigating a space really the choreographic projects but that are very close to elements and things I have been describing Next one is uh, from us, Basma. Sorry, yeah, sorry, Basma. You want to go ahead, Michael? Just go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I can ask for Basma since she's my colleague. <laughs> um, yeah, the I, I shared it in the chat, Tark, so yes. you can also see it. But um, basically, yeah. Basma is talking about we we look at a lot of like visual preservation, right? like um, uh, this idea of visual phenomenon. Mm. And, preservation of monuments and typography but what about <laughs> sound pre preservation um like you know the, the traditional vegetable seller calls are becoming yeah. extinct these kind of ideas the calls of uh, uh, <laughs> markets in cairo and an ancient violin and these kind of things so what are your thoughts on this yeah. Well, Basma, like here, I, I i send you this project i did called the reverse collection and wait I'll, I'll try to get my book one second Oh, I'll reach out to a book of mine here. That's that's a book on the project. Uh, very quickly, I'll show you a few images. Perfect. One second. So, Basma, this is the situation of the, the images I'm showing you here are images from the storage of an anthropology museum. 
in Berlin, in which I saw like one, once like hundreds of instruments lying on the ground, on shelves, in situation where we did not know what was what, what was from when, what was from where. So these instruments stopped making sounds because when they entered the uh, uh, Ethnomusicology Museum, we uh, preserved them, conserved them with chemical products and things where they were not allowed to be touched or played anymore. We tried to preserve the materials with the intent that uh, through this preservation and conservation effort, we will be able to redo replicas that we could play and find back the sound of these instruments. The project I did, well, actually, the second part of this project was to say exactly your question, was to ask the question of what would happen if we record these instruments and invite instrument makers from different parts of the world and different cultures to just listen to the sounds and build new instruments, you see. And there was a whole project I did where like people from listening to sounds of things that weren't supposed to sound really created the objects. And really, if you understand the world through sounds, what this project showed me is that form function, material, everything can change and you have the possibility to go into so many places. So when it comes to preserving the sound of a Stradivarius, you see, uh, of course you can record it. Of course you can um, uh, preserve it as an ethno ethnographic or ethnomusicology museum uh, collection of instrument does, but maybe the best way of preserving it is by having it played constantly, you know, and uh, played constantly, not by anybody, but by really highly skilled people, because the wood in the instrument remembers, because uh, an instrument has a memory, and when it's played, uh, and the sound that it emits crafts its nature or its being. So the quality of the wood, the fibers, how the inner fibers intertwine and everything is shaped by the passage of sound inside the instrument. And it makes it age better, like wine, like uh, violins, like kuchins, these Chinese string instruments, all these things age better when they are constantly played and played with care and by highly skilled people. So uh, yeah, that's uh, maybe uh, the best thing with, sound rather than just trying to uh, record it and listen to it in a nostalgic way, or, but no, just see it as an active way of understanding the world. And yes, it's uh, uh, nothing is lost in this way. Just things change, but they are not lost. Thank you, Tarek. So I think I didn't, see, I didn't see any uh, more questions and uh, we kind of reached the time we wanted to reach. It was a great mm -hmm. uh, presentation. It was a great conversation. Fine, thank uh, you. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, we've been uh, meeting often this semester. It is a pleasure and uh, we will continue and that's uh, kind of a privilege, but something you said that will uh, resonate with me uh, is uh, uh, the act of listening as a, a great lesson of uh, humility. And uh, I really thank you for uh, your words and uh, to show us how to listen in a different way and how to enrich that uh, that's such an important action. Thank you very thank much, you. Tarek. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Very you. And thank you all, Amir. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, invitation from the long times. We, we've been together uh, and met since Sharjah. Uh, really, I hope there will be better times and we get to meet in person. I was, I was meant to be with Qatar giving this talk today and like in maybe in person with you in the room. Uh, yeah, hopefully uh, soon. Yes, Andrea also, thank you. Oh, Andrea is an old uh, <laughs> friend from where I was in Italy. Wow. It's interesting to see people coming on from all over the world. Yes.
Yes, beautiful. Thank you again. I don't know how to finish yeah. this. I yeah, know, I, uh, but, yes. <laughs> I can say a quick thank you, Tarek. This has been excellent. Um, and thank you to everyone for attending today's lecture. And we invite you to join the next lecture by architect Virginia Lung on April 13th at 12 p.m. Eastern and 7 p.m. Qatar. So Super great, great you. to have you here. This was Thank wonderful. You. Looking forward to more yes. and in person. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> yes. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Ciao, Tarek. Ciao.